Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 628. 628. December the 7th, 2018. Friday. Happy Friday everyone. December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. Maybe today will live in infamy. I don't know. <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Well, probably the bis uh, biggest uh, gossip or rumor or a uh, story that was going around on Thursday afternoon was the leaked information. Uh, of course, it was being reported by the Washington Post originally, so I'm not sure uh, how much confidence I have in it, but this is the big leak story that was going around on Thursday, is that Trump's primary number one consideration for a new attorney general is William Barr. B-A-R-R, -R, William Barr. He's being flo floated as Trump's pick for the AG. It appears that Ratcliffe is still in the running and probably uh, a close second. But what we're hearing from the Washington Post is that senior White House officials, senior White House legal um, staff is telling Trump that Barr would be a fantastic pick because he would easily be confirmed because Republicans and Democrats love him. Let's dig into the background of William Barr. He was the former Attorney General under George Herbert Walker Bush from 1991 to 1993. Now, I do remember a little bit about uh, Barr. If I remember correctly, what I remember most about him is the big controversy that occurred when he signed off on the pardons for quite a few Reagan administration officials, many of whom were uh, caught up in the Iran-Contra scandal, including Casper Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense, who essentially, for the most part, uh, had to admit, um, well, for the most part, he misled Congress, uh, didn't testify truthfully, uh, and so uh, he was going to be sent to jail, but he ended up being pardoned. And Barr, of course, would sign off on that. So one thing that we know about Barr is that he is known as a, an establishment, old school type Republican, pretty much of a straight shooter, has a similar personality to Trump, not quite as crazy as Trump, but very much uh, a type of person who kind of says what he thinks, um, but he is known as being very comfortable with the establishment of the Republican Party as well as the Washington establishment and that he's respected on both sides of the aisle. Now, to the Washington Post or to most people, that would sound like a really good attribute. To me, that sounds like the kiss of death. He is currently an attorney with the law firm Kirkland and Ellis. <laughs> Barr is 67 years old, just turned 68 actually. And uh, of course he is a Republican. He was born in New York City, graduated from Columbia University, went to George Washington University Law School, graduated in 77. He worked for the Central Intelligence Agency from 73 to 77. He worked on policy in the Reagan administration from 1982 to 1983. He is a strong supporter of presidential powers. He does not think that the Supreme Court should have heard the Roe versus Wade case. He, sh he believes that it should have been a state's, uh, an issue left to the states. He had 14 years in the private sector as a senior executive, including the VP for Verizon. Now Verizon was originally GTE, which I believe was General Telephone something or other, uh, GTE. And then GTE, of course, merged and became part of Verizon. And he was with GTE and then they became Verizon and he remained with them and that's how he ended up with the 14 years with uh, Verizon but it actually spent most of that time with GTE. 
He serves on several corporate boards. He has supported the communications industry's deregulation. He was an independent director for Time Warner. He fought to keep, as Attorney General, he had fought, he fought to keep people with AIDS and HIV from immigrating to the U.S. He is Roman Catholic. He's married and has three da daughters. He was at one time the, he was at one time Uncle Bob the Executioner, Mueller's boss. He likes Mueller, but he says he's not happy with Mueller's collection of anti-Trumpers that he put on his team when appointed special counsel. He wrote an op-ed after Trump fired Comey, defending Trump's right to have fired Comey and agreed that Comey's mishandling of the Clinton email investigation and, her, and the exoneration thereof uh, made the firing justified. He has also stated that both Bill and Hillary should be investigated for their role or their activities within and around Uranium One. It appears that Trump has never met Barr, but he likes him. Isn't that strange? Now, I had no idea this is coming. I did my video yesterday, for those of you who saw Thursday's video, and I one of the points, uh, of one of the topics of that video was that I was saying that we need to watch who Trump appoints as his new attorney general because that will tell us a lot about what may happen with the Spygate investigation as we move forward after the new Congress is sworn in. And I said this would be the most important appointment Trump will make in his presidency. And if he gets it wrong, his presidency may be a one-term presidency. I like John Ratcliffe. If I have my choice, this will be a no-brainer. Ratcliffe. Ratcliffe might have more difficulty getting confirmed, and especially because he has been uh, working on uh, the uh, spy gate or the frame-up or whatever you want to call it, and of course has been one of the people chiefly investigating and looking into the corruption at the DOJ and the FBI. And that would probably create considerable problems for him in the confirmation process. And they would probably try to force him to recuse himself from that investigation. Another important thing uh, that will come into play here is what about Rodenstein? Will Rodenstein remain as the assistant attorney general or will he be gone? And what happens to Matt Whitaker? Generally, Trump rewards people who are loyal to him. John Kelly said that Whitaker was brought in to be the eyes and ears for the White House. As far as I know, Trump's never made any negative tweets about Whitaker, so we can assume that he generally likes the job that Whitaker is doing. You would think that Trump will want to find a place for Whitaker if he gets pushed out, because once you name a new attorney general, then Whitaker essentially has no job. There's no need for an acting attorney general once your new attorney general is confirmed. But you would think that Trump might find a role for him, and it's possible that that Trump could cut a deal with um, uh, what's his name. He could cut a deal with Mr. Barr and say, "Hey, I'd like you to keep Whitaker on and name him your." Uh, your deputy attorney general and fire Rodenstein. Hard to say exactly how this is all going to play out. I would just much rather see Ratcliffe. But it appears that if this story is true and this leak is true and that Trump is pretty much sold on Barr, and we'll probably learn more about that because we're hearing that Trump is interested in naming his new attorney general uh, very soon. He's apparently pretty much made up his mind is what's being reported and that he wants to make that appointment known very soon. 
which means the confirmation process would begin in the Senate shortly after the new year. So, based on the background I can see of Mr. Barr, obviously he's a establishment Republican. He uh, is obviously has a lot of friends on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. He's probably deep state. Um, he likes Mueller, knows Mueller. Mueller used to work under him. He's not really criticized the Mueller witch hunt. He has only criticized the fact that he thinks that Uncle Bob made it a bit too political by putting all those political people and Democrats on his team. He has supported Trump on firing Comey. So, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to think, but I'm not really excited. Not really excited about Barr from uh, what I have learned about him so far. I'm sure we'll learn more in the days to come, especially if Trump names him uh, as his pick for the new attorney general. And maybe this is what Trump's shooting for, is someone that he thinks he can get nominated easily. He doesn't maybe want to have a big fight. I think getting a good attorney general is worth the fight. And there's a lot of, Demo or a lot of Republicans who just won their elections in the Senate that owe their Senate seat to Trump. He's the one that went and campaigned for them and carried them across the finish line. They owe him the attorney general that he wants. So I guess put me in the column of not very excited about this pick. I was hoping for someone outside the establishment. I would much prefer to see Whitaker. And I understand that Whitaker was hoping he would be considered but his name is not even coming up. When you see the people talking about it, they don't even bring Whitaker up as even being a possibility. His resume would be a little light for the, for the uh, attorney general position, but if that's who Trump wants, his background is not that bad. Um, his resume is not that weak. Um, and we know that he's got Trump's back. Mr. Burr, or Mr. Barr, I don't know. Sounds a lot like another Jeff Sessions to me. So, there you go. Well, it looks like the Ecuadorian President, Lenin Moreno, says that the United Kingdom has provided written assurances that they will not extradite Assange to any country where he will face the death penalty. Moreno says that um, it is a sufficient guarantee that Assange could leave the Ecuadorian embassy at his convenience. <laughs> How many of you think that uh, the U.S. government is going to allow Julian Assange to walk out of the Ecuadorian embassy in the U.K., hop on a plane, and go to wherever he wants to go? <laughs> Uh, I would have to actually see that to believe it. I think that the minute he walks out the door of the Ecuadorian embassy, maybe the UK will not, you know, openly uh, cooperate with the United States, but you can bet that the United States is going to have FBI people waiting on the street. And as soon as Assange comes down the steps and hits the street, and as soon as he holds out his hand for a cab, they're going to throw his ass in a black van and that's the last you'll see of Assange for a very long time. He better be very, very careful before he considers this deal. And we also know that this new Ecuadorian president doesn't have Assange's back quite the way the previous president did. And we know that American officials have been down there in Ecuador working on him, working on him over Assange. This could very well be a setup. Assange better be very, very careful on how he handles this. <clears throat> well, apparently voters in France have buyer's remorse, and Macron's party is obviously having buyer's remorse because it appears, from what we're hearing from the European news wires, is that there is now a movement underfoot within the parliament in France 
from the left-wing parliament in France to have a no-confidence vote very soon, in the very near future, for Macron. At the same time, there are some big activities planned for this Saturday. We'll be getting to that in a moment. Madame Botox, Nancy Piglosi, says that she is not going to support any funding for the border wall. That's starting out on the right foot. We have Theresa Mays, ex-chief of staff, saying this week was the week that Brexit was finally killed. You know, there's a couple ways you can look at this thing. And here's how I see it. The people in the UK had a vote for Brexit and Brexit won. And afterwards, the very day after Brexit, the powers that be decided that there was not going to be any Brexit. And so, for the past two years, they've been working to make that happen. And now, essentially, what you're seeing is there's not going to be any Brexit. Now, here's how that could play out. The citizens of the UK have now learned that by participating in the peaceful democratic process of voting for a re referendum is no longer an efficient way to achieve um, a successful democratic outcome on an issue. That's not going to work anymore. So, the next time that the citizens in the UK are fed up and decide that they need to make some changes, they're probably not going to uh, get suckered into a referendum vote, which they know will likely be overturned if it doesn't go the way that the uh, establishment wants. They'll just keep having more votes until they get the result they want. So, this is very dangerous for the UK. The elites in the UK may think that they've won this round, and they probably have, the way it looks now. But the problem is the future. When these people get riled up again, and get fed up again, and decide that they need to make some changes. And they'll be told, okay, we'll have a referendum vote. The folks are going to say, I don't think so. We had a referendum vote once before and you screwed us. We don't have any confidence in a referendum vote. We'll just bring pitchforks this time. That's how they'll get results. That's exactly how they'll get results and that's what they know. That's my thoughts on how that might go. Did everyone enjoy the Bush 41 funeral? I sure hope you did, because it appears that the cost of that to the taxpayers was $453 million. $453 million was the cost to the taxpayer for the five-day-long funeral of George Herbert Walker Bush. Not bad for a Nazi in America. Let's see. We have MSNBC host Katie Turr. She's nuts. Most of you know that already. Uh, whose father is now a woman. So I guess her father is now her mother, which means she has two mothers, which might explain her mental deficiency. So Katie Turr's life according to her in a segment she did, is now meaningless. She says, if we do not talk about climate change every day, life is meaningless. She says her life is pointless because climate change is going to destroy the planet so she has no future. Well, Katie, climate change will not destroy this planet. It's a big freaking rock. What will destroy this planet is when in about 450 million years uh, from now, when we are burned up by the sun, 
which will become a red dwarf. That's what's going to happen, Katie. In 450 million years, it will be too hot to live on this planet. Most of the water on the planet will be dried up. There won't be any water on the planet. It will be smoking hot, Katie. As far as climate change, well, the planet's 4.3 billion years old. 4.3 billion years ago, we were a gigantic ball of plasma for a period of several million years. And then we had a collision with another pretty good sized rock. And that is now our moon. Since then, our planet went turned into a gigantic frozen ball of ice for a few hundred million years. Then the ice began to melt. Uh, then the planet went through many, many, many different changes. You couldn't even live on this planet. Life could not even survive on this planet until about, what, 1.1 million years ago? I mean, actual modern, uh, like, as in uh, advanced life, other than single-cell amoebas. This planet's been a ball of ice. This planet's been a ball of fire. There was a period for about a million years. No, actually, it was 100. Yeah, there was a period for about 100 million years when we were being pelted by gigantic asteroids day after day after day after day. Look at the planet. It's full of gigantic craters. Look at the moon. It's full of craters. Look at just about any rock solid planet, not the gas planets. Look at the rock planets in our solar systems. They all have gigantic, gigantic divots and crevices and cracks and holes in them. From, from that time, for about 100 million years, where we were being pelted every day with gigantic asteroids. At one time, there was only one solid land mass on this planet. And it broke apart. And these pieces drifted apart. Then they drifted back together, connected again, and then drifted back apart again. The fact of the matter is, Katie, this planet has been going through unbelievable changes for 4.3 billion years. Long before any human or any lawnmowers existed. And that's going to continue, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. The next major climate event, Katie, is not going to be global warming or uh, any of that other stuff. What's going to happen is in about 5,500 years from now, we're going to go back into a mini ice age. And then 11,000 years from now, it will be a full-blown ice age for a period of about 100,000 years. Then the planet will warm back up again, and everything will green back up again, and we'll go through another cycle. And this will happen over and over again as we move toward the eventual conclusion of life on this planet, which will mean about uh, uh, 450 million years from now, when eventually the planet will just burn up. But Katie, the planet will not be destroyed, so to speak. It's just a big rock floating around in space. It's always going to be a big rock floating around in space. Now, at some point, it will not be possible for humans like us to live on this planet. Two hundred and fifty, what? How many year, million years? Uh, uh, two, about two billion years ago, uh, our atmosphere was um, sulfur. You see, Earth changes have been going on for a very, very long time. They will continue to go on, but the planet isn't going anywhere, huh, Katie? Planet isn't going anywhere. life forms that we have on this planet now are definitely going somewhere and that's extinct. Every single life form on this planet has gone extinct. Every day hundreds if not thousands of species become extinct. And eventually, Katie, our day will come. Probably somewhere in the 400 to 450 million year range. Humans will essentially become extinct. But this big rock spinning in space will continue to sit right where it's at it will become a flaming probably a hot dry rock for 
few hundred million years and then it will cool as the sun burns out and then our entire solar system will just die just a bunch of ice cold rocks floating around in space but they ain't going anywhere Katie but you are this Saturday France will be deploying 89,000 cops and security forces ahead of what is being called a attempted or suspected coup attempt set for Saturday by these yellow vest or yellow jackets, whatever you want to call them. Apparently, the yellow jackets are, yellow jackets are calling for storming the castle. And they're saying bring guns, knives, and rope. They're going to attempt a coup on Saturday in France. And the government is preparing for that. At the same time, the far left-wing groups join together. Keep in mind, there's 13 parties in France. Almost all of them are on the left. They just go left, more 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 left. When you get to the final end, as far left as you can go, there's about a half a dozen of the far left parties that have joined together and they are apparently working together to have a no-confidence vote against Macron. So, as I've said a couple times before, 2019 is shaping up to be a very turbulent year for the European Union. And I'm not sure the European Union survives 2019 or 2020. Here's what you have going on. I read through the list of countries right now where you have populist nationalist uprisings. Merkel is gone, driven out by populist parties in Germany. Uh, the populist party in Germany, the populist nationalist party there is now the most popular party. In France, Marine Le Pen's party, which changed its name, but it's still Marine Le Pen's party, is now the most popular party in France. Keep in mind, with, then we have 20 some odd percent of, uh, of, of the popular support, but there's 13 parties so if there's 13 parties and you've got 20 some odd percent, that makes you number one. So Marine Le Pen's party right now is number one. So what's going to happen is in May of 2019 is the elections for the European Parliament, which is where Nigel Farage is. He's in the Euro European Parliament. He's usually the lone wolf out there. He's usually the main anti-EU guy there in the European Parliament. But if things pan out the way it looks now, with all these populist, nationalist, anti-EU parties being as successful as they are and as popular as they are all across Europe, what you're going to see in the European elections in May of 2019 is a lot of anti-EU, nationalist, populist winning seats in the European Parliament. This is going to set up a very dicey situation for the European Parliament, which has always been dominated with pro-EU MPs. But what happens after the May elections in the European Parliament, and it ends up being even 50-50, could be more than 50-50, anti-EU MPs in the European Parliament. They could vote to dissolve the European Union. They would have the votes. It's very likely that we could see the populist nationalists all across Europe elect enough MPs into the European parliamentary elections in May of 2019 that it could totally change the direction that the, EU, that the European Parliament goes. You could have a real... <laughs> A real show uh, could happen there. And even if they don't get the majority, there's certainly going to be much, much more representation in the European Parliament by these nationalist populist types coming uh, there as new MPs. And they're going to be joining Farage. And certainly they're going to uh, throw a wrench into the spokes of the EU, things like their migration policy, uh, their tax policy, there's going to be a lot more support for countries who would like to leave the EU. It could even mean that with totally different people, uh, more populist nationalist people in the European Parliament, that if they do 
call for a new um, election in the UK or a new referendum in the UK on Brexit with all these uh, anti-EU MPs now in the European Parliament, it could totally change the nature of the Brexit deal. So it might be very wise for those people in, in the UK who voted for Brexit, it might be very wise for them to do everything they can to oppose a new Brexit vote and to go along with the other plan, which is to allow members of the parliament to make changes after the deal is signed. Setting the stage for what could happen in the European elections where they could get a lot more anti-EU MPs from across Europe, which would allow them to get the changes that they could make in, the, in, the, in this deal that May put together, that they could get the changes they want and possibly even get that deal to look a lot more like the Brexit they voted for. And you're not just going to see it coming from uh, the UK because it's very likely that things the way they look in France are going to take a turn towards populist nationalist type uh, leadership moving into positions of power and their elections. You're seeing it all over Europe so you could really see things. We just saw what happened in Spain. So all these things coupled together are going to make for a very tumultuous uh, year in Europe for the European Parliament. And it's unknown at this point exactly what's going to happen here in the U.S. as far as unraveling the spygate or whether it all gets swept away. But if, in fact, things turn out the way they look like they're going to turn out for the European elections in May, and if, in fact, um, the deep state criminals are brought to justice here in the United States, we could be looking at a massive defeat of the globalist New World Order, of the left in general. Could be a very, very interesting year, and I think it will be. But I am concerned about Trump's AG pick. It's critical because so much of what is happening in Europe is happening a lot on the coattails of Trump. He didn't start it. It actually started in Europe. Then we had Brexit. They successfully uh, voted to leave the EU. Then Trump wins, riding on the same coattails. But since he's been elected, he's actually delivered. He's actually done what he said he would do up to this point. He has done what he said he would do to the best of his ability. So that's why I do hold out hope. And I believe, like a lot of people in the comments section, that if Trump has a plan or if he's planning on making a move, that he's going to make a move after the new Congress takes over and he's got a much better Senate, which won't impeach him, by the way, and a Senate that will approve uh, a lot of his judges, will approve of his cabinet picks, because he's likely to make other changes in his cabinet as well. But I really am concerned about the AG pick. I don't know if this is a this story floated by the Washington Post is garbage or if it's true. It's hard to say. I would be very, very surprised if Trump appoints an attorney general who shows little or no interest in taking down the deep state that tried to destroy Trump and is still trying to destroy Trump. And they're going to continue trying to destroy Trump. I would be very surprised. It would almost be like him waving the white flag. And it would be an example of Trump not following through on something he said he would do. And so far, that's not been his M.O. So far, he has followed through or tried to follow through on everything he said he would do to the best of his ability. So there's a lot of question marks. But we'll keep watching. Thank you all for tuning in. And I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. You guys have a good night. Stay warm.